And a lot of times it takes, God always asks the Israelites to build stones of remembrance, Ebenezer's, and to build altars where they could bring their kids to and show them the milestones that they reached. Well, I tell you, that I'm keeping a track of all these bulletins that we receive every week, and, and they're stored on my computer as files, and I, I fully intend to keep those as Ebenezer's. And to one day look back and tell the stories uh, to our kids and our grandkids and say, I want you to look at God's faithfulness. I want you to look at the track record. Sometimes, see, we prove the will of God. God, and we prove the vision of God by looking back and seeing what he done. And when you look back over our last 10 years here at Souls Harbor, there's no question in anybody's mind that this leader was following the leader. Uh, you're talking about a two and a half, three million dollar project, easy, uh, that Pastor Ball was in charge of leading. And to pull that off, I'm telling you, it was far beyond one man. And he'll be the first to tell you that it was a God thing. It was a cooperative effort. And only the Lord can pull things off like that. Are you glad that God's the author of good visions and good dreams and clear direction and goals? Amen. Well, I love the fact that he's the author of all the good things in our life. I love the fact that he's the author of goals and visions and dreams. And I, but I tell you what excites me even more is the fact that he's the finisher of goals and dreams and visions in my heart and in your heart, in our lives, and in, in the corporate church of America today. And at Souls Harbor Church, God is not only the author of all of our dreams and visions, he's also the finisher. And in your own life, he's not only the author of the things that are on your heart to fulfill for God, but he will too be the finisher. I love the fact today that we started with the, uh, the video clip of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. And you know what that signifies to you and I as believers today? It signifies the last words that Jesus mentioned. In his dying breath, he, he uttered these words, It is finished. And what Jesus was drawing attention to was the fact that God always finishes what he starts. That there was a, a beginning work, there was an authored work of God in the time of creation, and now there's a finished completion of God's work on the cross at Calvary that you and I can believe on and that we can receive as the finished work for my life and the finished work for my sins and the finished work for my future. And I can believe on the finished work of Jesus and carry that into the life of eternal. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing for you and I. God's the author and God's the finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12 today, verse 1, it calls attention to this very thing. It says, wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. See, what Pastor Ball's just called attention to is, is to let's just pace ourselves in the, in the new vision that's going forward. And the Bible says it's all right to pace yourself. It says, let's run this race with patience. We're going to finish the course. We're going to complete the work. God's going to complete it for us. But let's just pace ourselves. Let's run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus always, the author, and not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Some asked, why did Jesus do what he did? Well, I believe that he hung in shame so that you and I never have to hang in shame. I believe that he died in my stead so that I don't have to pay the death penalty of sin for my own life. And you don't have to pay the death penalty of sin for your own life. He, despising the shame, is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm glad that three days later, someone said, I just checked the tomb a while ago, and he's risen. He's still not there. Amen? Are you glad that Jesus is still alive and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, scripture wants us to consider this, and endure such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. It's God's desire that we continually to remember the work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. And he wants us to remember that because he wants us to remember that he is the author of all things good. And he's also the finisher of the visions and dreams that he gives you and I as believers. You see, a long time ago, back in Genesis chapter 2, we read of the creation account. And we read that in creation, God started all things in a garden called the Garden of Eden. You're acquainted with that and you remember that. The Bible tells us about this garden in Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. It says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was there in the midst of the garden. 
and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, scholars can tell us a lot more about this garden than Scripture does. But this garden, you can only imagine, was, was the finished product of God, the author of all things. And this garden was a beautiful, beautiful garden. The description of it leaves no question as to the beauty and extravagance of God's garden. This was the perfect home for man. It was created before sin ever existed. Its beauty was perfect. The lush vegetation contained fruit trees never before known to man. A river is said to wander through the biblical garden of Eden, providing the garden's water and source. The river's source is said to be in Eden, though not in the garden itself. The story of the biblical garden of Eden, however, first begins with what God had planted in the garden, which helped contribute to its divine uniqueness. The word Eden literally means delight. It was a garden of delight, full of heavenly fruit growing on trees. This garden was full of color, a beautiful array of flowering colors, pleasing to the sight. The aroma was surely one of sweetness, and the fruit, food brought healing to Adam and Eve's mortal bodies. It was literally pure paradise. You see, when God made all things, he made all things perfect, and he made all things good. And I need to remember that God is the author of good. I need to remember that God is the author of perfect I need to remember that God is the author of excellence. Anything that's not excellent in my life, anything that's not good in my life, the things that I'll see and witness as evil, I need to be reminded that God is the creator of good. Those things didn't come from God. You see, God's creation was perfect. God's creation had no flaws. God's creation was beautiful. Could you imagine the beauty here in the Garden of Eden? And we know what messed up God's perfect creation. It was man. It was the decision of mankind. And once Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, then sin came into the world, and now evil is present. I see evil. You see evil. And the things that we see that are not good in our lives, we need to be reminded they are not of God. God is the author of good. Now, I need to know that. I also need to know that there was a couple of trees in the garden. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, this tree of life, the Scripture says that Adam and Eve were, were allowed to eat from this tree. They were encouraged to eat from this tree. This was the tree that was going to provide life to them for all of eternity. You see, death was never part of God's plan. You see, evil was never part of God's plan. God's plan was to provide a, a nourishment, to provide a nourishment, to provide a fruit that would keep Adam and Eve alive for all of eternity. And he asked them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know that they did. You see, it all started in a garden, the Garden of Eden. But in God's perfect plan, and the only way that he can, he brought it all to this great point in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 18. The Bible says when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples, and Judas also, which betrayed him. For Jesus oftentimes resorted there with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. You see, it all started in the Garden of Eden. But it all ended in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed a prayer to God. And he said, Father, three different times, if it's possible to do this any other way, can this cup pass from me? And God's response over and over and over again was, there is no other way. And finally, Jesus looks at the Father and he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. From that moment on, we never read of another struggle that Jesus had concerning the cross. We never read of another fear or doubt that Jesus had concerning the cross. From that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, that was where the decision was made. That was where the victory was won. That was where it was decided once and for all that Jesus was going to be the sinless, spotless lamb that was going to plead and give his life for you and I in our stead. And it was in the Garden of Gethsemane where the finished work happened. You see, it all started with a bite of betrayal. On a fruit that Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat of. The tree of knowledge and good and evil. It was never God's design for man to know evil. Eve ate of this fruit and from that bite of betrayal, 
But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that it ended with a kiss of betrayal. Where Judas comes and he places a kiss upon Jesus' face. It started with a bite of betrayal. It ended with a kiss of betrayal. It started in the Garden of Eden with deliberate disobedience. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But it ended in complete obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. I surrender my will to yours, Father. You see, it all started with the tree of knowledge and good and evil which Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat from. But fast forward a few thousand years later and as only God can, he's not only the author but he's the finisher of our faith, it all ended on a tree as well. And I'm glad today of the tree of the cross of Calvary that held our loving Savior Jesus Christ. Luke 23, 33 says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. It ended on a tree, folks. Ended on a tree. It started with the shedding of blood in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says one of the first things that happened after Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, after they disobeyed God, after they sinned against their father, was that God went out and he had to kill an innocent lamb. He took the lamb's coat and he wrapped it around Adam and Eve's bodies to hide their nakedness, to hide their shame, to hide their guilt. That was the first shedding of blood that ever had to happen for sin. But I'm here to report to you that just as the shedding of blood was where it was all authored, the shedding of blood was where it was all finished. And I can tell you about the last lamb that was ever offered. I can tell you about the last blood that was ever had to be shed. I can tell you about the blood that still today has power to heal. I can tell you about the blood that still today has power to set free, has power to deliver, has power to forgive sins. And that blood, friend, is the blood that has been applied to my life and has been applied to your life. And that blood is the blood of Jesus Christ. It started with the shedding of blood. And it ended with the shedding of blood. John chapter 19 verse 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Thank you, God, for the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. It started with the banishment from God's presence. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had eat of the forbidden fruit, and they had committed the first sin of humanity, then we're told that they were excommunicated from the garden. So much so that God even allowed angels to come down and stand guard against the tree of life. They were there to guard Adam and Eve and all their descendants from ever being able to come back and eat of this tree of life in the Garden of, I guess, in the garden of Eden. And so forever mankind was banned from the Garden of Eden, banned from the presence of God. All throughout the Old Testament, only a significant group of people, only a special qualified group of people known as the high priest were allowed to ever go in to the Holy of Holies and and ever partake in the presence of God. But I'm here to tell you that it all started with the banishment of God's presence. But it ended when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And he cried out these words and said, it is finished There were some significant things that happened. Number one, there was an earthquake that took place. And we know that the sky went black. But but down in the church and the temple, something else happened. And the Bible says that that veil that separated God's presence from the holy court, from the inner court, the Bible says that veil was torn from the top to the bottom, which signifies that now God's presence is no longer confined to the Ark of the Covenant. It's no longer locked up in a box. It's no longer inside the Holy of Holies. But God's presence is now free to invade your heart and invade my heart to go with you in your daily activities and go with me into my daily activities. God's presence is now available to me and available to you. Mark 15, 37 says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. It all started with the curse of sin. But it ended with eradication of sin and its curse. Galatians chapter 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. 
He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be righteous. He who was not cursed became cursed so that you and I never have to know what cursed feels like. We can walk in God's blessing. We can walk in God's goodness. We can walk in God's favor. I can be the apple of his eye. I can be his choice child. And you can be his choice child. See, he has no favorites. He loves me just like he loves you. And he loves everyone equal. You know what makes that possible? The blood of Jesus Christ. Because now when God sees me, he sees his son. He sees a completed work. He sees it is finished. Now we can be righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says it like this. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Aren't you glad of that? And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As through God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, God's made it possible that we can be reconciled to him. You know, there's a a distinct difference in forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is a one-way street. I can forgive you without you ever forgiving me. But reconciliation can only happen when I forgive you, you forgive me, and we talk about it together. You see, that's what God's in the business of. He's in the business of reconciliation. He's not just about forgiveness. That's only half of repentance. Half of repentance is saying, I'm sorry. I recognize I've done wrong. But the other half of repentance is turning from our wrong and going a different way and letting God help us walk in a brand new way, reconciling ourselves to God. Now, God started the process. He made the first step towards us. Now, it's our opportunity and it's our obligation to complete that finished work, to be reconciled back to God. Are you glad of reconciliation? Are you glad that we can be declared right and just? Amen. I'm here today to tell you that whatever God starts, he's capable, he's willing, and he will finish. He's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. He will finish what he started, and Philippians 1, 6 says it this way, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the point in the sermon where it gets personal. You see, we've talked about how God was faithful to humanity. We've talked about how God was faithful to Souls Harbor Church, and he will continue to be. You see, God's the author of all these dreams and visions and goals, but I'm here to tell you that he's the finisher. And if we think it's beautiful uh, 10 years, you wait for the next 10 years and see how beautiful. And I'm here to tell you, if you think it was beautiful in the Garden of Eden, just hang around to the new heaven and new earth is completed. When we're walking around here for a 1,000 years throughout the millennium, I can't imagine the beauty that God has in store. But in your personal life, I'm here to declare to you today, whatever God started, whatever vision, whatever dream, that thing he's called you to do that's on the inside, that work that he started, he's faithful and he's just to perfect it and complete it. He will finish what he started in you. You see, I I know that there has to be unfulfilled promises out there. I know there has to be prayers that are still unanswered out there. I know there has to be dreams and visions that have yet to be fulfilled. And I've just come by to tell you this morning, have faith in God. From the time of creation, God's been completing what he started. And he's not going to make an exception for you. What he started, he will finish. God is the author and finisher of our faith. Can we give him glory this morning? Thank you, God.